Okay, folks, it is now 1 p.m. here in Oslo, and that means that we are going to get started with the, with, was it day three now of the annual DHIS2 conference? Day four. Day four. Okay. <laughs> Time has been flying by. So, welcome to the session. This session will be on logistics and lab management information systems. My name is Scott Russ Patrick. I'm the DHIS2 Analytics Product Manager at the University of Oslo, and I am very pleased to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we're doing with um, logistics management information systems. And then I'm also very happy to have a um, wonderful group of folks that will take us through several use cases and experiences from the field in using DHIS2 for logistics and lab. So let me just progress through a little bit of the program. I'm going to get us started off with going through the DHIS2 or slash the University of Oslo strategy for supply chain, fill in some gaps that you guys know what we're planning to do uh, with DHIS2 to be able to support logistics information systems. And then we have a really interesting story from George McGuire on the International Red Cross's use of DHIS2 for logistics tracking um, uh, in field hospitals in Yemen. And actually, George is joining us from a field hospital in Yemen, so that's quite exciting. Hopefully, his connection stays good. Then we have another really interesting use case from uh, Zuina Kondo um, on the TB lab sample referral system in Tanzania, I believe. And then um, Billy Rajab from Malawi is going to wrap us up with a case study on integrated lab management software. Hopefully at the end, we'll have a, uh, maybe five, 10 minutes for questions, if we can. If we don't have time, please post your questions to the community of practice. We'll keep an eye on the community of practice as the questions come in and make sure that you get answers to them. All right, let's get started in with the University of Oslo's approach to um, logistics management information systems. We actually give this presentation every year, and every year it, it actually is significantly different from the next. We make pretty dramatic improvements in terms of DHIS2 use and functionality and support for supply chain. So I'm going to kind of go through what we've done a little bit in the past as well as what's on the roadmap um, going forward. Why do we always keep talking about this every year? Well, it's actually really quite simple. It is because countries keep asking for it every single year and they keep asking for more and more. And specifically what they're saying is we use DHIS2 for routine health surveillance. Why can't we use it for routine supply chain? monitoring. And over the, for the first few years that this was going on, we didn't actually have a very clear answer. We just said, yeah, maybe it kind of works. Sometimes it doesn't work as exactly like you, you want it to, but you know, it, it, it kind of goes along. Over the years, we have realized that that is profoundly insufficient and that we as a health information system need to be able to support the supply chain component to make sure that we get all of the data into one place so that we're providing DHIS2 as a platform that can host all data coming from all sources in the country. So you can get all of your analytics um, uh, together in one place. And that's really kind of the key principle that we're operating off of. We, as and in partnership as a collaborating center with WHO, moving very hand in hand with them on this, believe that a strong health information system should include the ability to have analytics and data from all of your various health programs, as well as your logistics and your uh, and other things like HR and maybe even finance as well. And it's by getting all of these various data sources in one place, being able to build indicators, being able to build dashboards, uh, composite analytics um, across all of these various data sources, are you actually able to get to kind of the goal of everyone, which is um, bottleneck analysis, root cause analysis, being able to tie your health outcomes, your clinical services, specifically to issues with supply chain or issues with human resources, and being able to know exactly where the problem is to be able to address it. We appreciate that all these data sources need to be in one place, and we want DHS to be able to be that place if countries want it to be. So what exactly then do we want to do to be a little bit more specific with you? We want to make sure that DHIS2 is a single platform that can facilitate all data sources coming from the health facilities as well as community health workers. And that 
specifically includes supply chain and logistics data. We also want DHIS2 to be able to be able uh, to speak with more specialized systems. So you can think of like warehouse systems or ERPs. Well, DHIS2 is not a warehouse system or an ERP, but we want DHIS2 to be able to push and pull data to those systems. So we have to maintain a, a, a solid API for that kind of interoperability. We want DHIS2 to also be able to produce all key logistics indicators. So again, that supply chain data can enter into DHIS2 from the lowest levels. And from that supply chain data, we want actually DHIS2 to have the analytics capacity to be able to calculate all logistics indicators. And we've been doing a lot of work and I'll go through that on its ability to do that. The second to last point here is to, we want to be able to provide countries guidance on how to use DHIS2 for supply chain. We want them to know what they can do, what they can't do, um, and to be able to help and reinforce these kinds of implementations over time. And the last point is arguably probably most, the most important one, and it is that we do not want DHIS2 to be a warehouse system or an ERP. DHIS2 is just poorly suited for those particular use cases. Now it should again be able to speak to those systems, but it definitely should not actually function as those systems. Here's a little bit of a model actually. We're working with a specific supply chain system, uh, a, a, an LMIS called Medexis in Burundi. And what we've actually managed to do with Medexis is come up with this nice model. And it kind of, I won't go through it in detail, but it kind of shows you the connection between DHIS2 and an LMIS that a country might have specifically that monitors their warehousing system their, uh, and their tra more transactional supply chain data. So in Burundi, they have all supply data entered at the facility level into DHIS2. And then DHIS2 pushes that data to Medexis. To go, so it sends information to the warehouse and the people in the warehouse are using Medexis. They're not using DHIS2. The people in the warehouse fill orders, they monitor stocks, uh, they push stocks out to health facilities, and then that data comes back to DHIS2. So that in DHIS2, at any point, all of the program managers know what supply of key commodities are available at each health facility. Um, and we find this to be a, 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 a pretty good model that we want to build on top of. We want to reinforce this, and, and if any country actually wants to adopt DHIS2 in more of the supply chain capacity. We want to be able to present this as a model in partnership with Medexis and other open and uh, other kind of leading supply chain systems out there like OpenLMIS as well uh, as kind of a, an approach that would be appropriate for, for any country. This approach has essentially four legs that I'm gonna go through quite quickly and they are DHIS2 functionality, content, interoperability and integration with other supply chain systems and technical expertise. I'll just touch on each one of these quite quickly. For DHIS2 functionality, we have been improving the ability for DHIS2 to capture supply chain data. Specifically, we've incorporated QR and barcode scanning, which is very important for supply chain being able to scan in vials, uh, barcodes from commodities, boxes, that kind of stuff. Get that data very quickly into DHIS2. And I think maybe George might touch on this in his use case a little bit later. We also want DHIS2 to be a platform that other people can innovate and develop new applications that are more specific to supply chain data capture. Um, and we actually seen this in, in quite a few places where in Mali and Burkina Faso, there's a specific app that those countries use that's a DHIS2 app developed by His West Africa uh, to enable them to enter the supply chain data at facility level. The same story in Bangladesh as well as in Uganda. Um, the last point is that the capture app that we've developed ourselves has been totally integrated um, or has integrated aggregate data capture and um, tracker data capture. And we find that both aggregate and tracker are, re are required in kind of the logistics supply chain space. You won't necessarily have all your data in aggregate. You won't necessarily have all your data in the tracker. And that usually you're using a combination of the two. And the great thing about the, the Android app uh, nowadays is that both of those kind of appear together. The user doesn't have to move between multiple apps. They kind of, it's a very seamless workflow 
for them. Another big point in terms of the functionality is that we have been building our ability to calculate very advanced indicators. Really the supply chain and um, logistics space has some very complex indicators. Um, and we've been building out things like predictors, uh, advanced indicator logic, uh, uh, new indicator um, relationship models into the DHIS2 core to be able to calculate these kinds of indicators. And I'll give you just a, a quick example. These are the, some of the key supply chain indicators um, that we know DHIS2 is able to calculate now. So things like resupply, average consumption, stock status based upon available stock and average consumption, uh, order fill rates, monitor stock out days, um, know how many facilities are stocked out and exactly where those facilities are. The lead time, which is the time between the, the warehouse and the, and the, and the um, health facility. And we can do things like I just mentioned, line list all of the stock outs. Um, and just make it extremely clear where the facilities that have poor stock availability or, or, or stocked out are. And I think that that's exactly what we set up for Malawi. Um, over the last couple of years, we've been working with um, the Malawi government, our HIS partner in Malawi, um, and several other um, development partners to be able to tie their supply chain system, their, their LMIS, which is open LMIS, directly into DHIS2. And all of the open LMIS data actually pushes into DHIS2, and they use DHIS2 as their key analytics platform for their entire supply chain system. So what you're actually looking at right here is a simple, is a, as an example dashboard from Malawi that um, shows very, very easily and um, clearly all of the health facilities that have stock problems. You see some of the maps there, those big red spots on those maps, those are health facilities that have a stock out um, at that particular moment in time, a, a real stock out. Um, and, this is very actionable data. You can also see in the other charts and maps that they can see the facilities where there is, um, some facilities are overstocked. And they are actually able to use this data to transfer commodities between facilities that are close by, those facilities that are understocked or are out of stock, and those facilities that are adequate or overstocked. Um, and it, it's a, this, is a, this is not just a, um, a passive dashboard that they look at every once in a while when they're, in, when they're doing quarterly planning. They look at this dashboard every day and see today, where do I have my stock problems? So very actionable information. Um, we also see some other really cool analytics coming out of it. The great thing about having all of your data into one place is that you can actually build indicators that look at your caseload as well as your stock consumption and availability data. So again, in Malawi, and actually you're seeing another example from Mali, where they're actually able to build some really interesting indicators like issuance to consumption ratio, or caseload to consumption ratio, or caseload to issuance ratio. These kinds of indicators are actually much better at kind of forecasting where my stock is, uh, will, will become. For example, if I have an adequate stock this month, but my caseload is higher than my average, then, and if I don't get an adequate resupply, then next month I'll be understocked or potentially even stocked out. And so being able to look at the trends in caseload is a really great way of actually doing some forecasting for um, supply chain. And again, getting all that data in one place into DHIS2 enables you to actually do that. Finally, on the content side, just a few things to point out is that actually as of today, I received the copy from the WHO We've been working with them for quite a long time. George, uh, the next presenter, has been pretty integral to this process to actually be able to get um, standard indicators, supply chain indicators, that should be in the HMIS from all of the key um, WHO programs together in one place. And what we're actually going to do is take that list of indicators, which again, I just got emailed to me today, uh, the finalized list. What, what we'll actually be able to do is convert this into a standard metadata package. So the indicators come pre-configured in DHIS2, they come with the data elements, they come with some of the reporting forms and analytics from the dashboards. Uh, and we're going to package this up for you. And if you're a country that wants to implement DHIS2 for some element of their supply chain, and you want to follow the WHO standards, 
then all of that, a lot of that work's already been done for you. You can download the package, install it into your DHIS2 instance, and then you just need to modify it and update it based upon uh, any of the unique features or functionalities, reporting flows, uh, um, context of your, uh, of your country. But we've done this for other programs as well, like HIV, immunization, malaria, tuberculosis. Um, and it's really exciting that we're actually going to have something very similar for supply chain now as well. The next point that I just want to make quickly is on interoperability and integration. So we are working uh, increasingly closely with various other um, software out there that support the supply chain, um, specifically those systems that are solely designed to be uh, logistics management information systems and that cover areas like warehousing, like ERPs that DHIS2 is not suitable to cover. Um, so these are like open LMIS, uh, a little bit of communication with mSupply, and we're working quite closely nowadays with a platform called Medexis that's implemented in Burundi um, and a couple of other countries in Africa. So it's an excellent um, uh, LMIS. I highly recommend it. Uh, and we're working quite closely with those developers, you know, the, our developers talking to their developers um, to be able to make sure that these platforms are able to speak to each other. The goal being that countries have been struggling with these complex interoperability layers. Um, and we want to work with directly with the other platforms out there to either have integration or out of the box interoperability. So countries don't have to struggle with these interoperability layers as much or, um, or make, this, make, make the burden on the country significantly less. The last point that I wanna make is on the expertise. Um, this year, we have invested a lot of additional resources into supply chain. And so I'm really excited to be able to say that we are actually going to have two staff on the University of Oslo team specifically focused on the logistics systems and supporting those. So we will have an LMIS portfolio lead uh, we actually have identified the person. He's already signed the contract. So uh, we're, we're really excited to, to have um, uh, him on board in the very near future. The, he's coming from um, the Norwegian Red Cross, a huge amount of supply chain experience. Um, very practical. And then we also have the, um, we have an LMIS technical advisor coming on board, which will actually be your next presenter, George. Um, and George is an absolute guru um, of, of supply chain, LMIS, um, been working in it longer than I've basically been doing anything in my life. And, um, and so it, we're going to have an, an incredible team here at the University of Oslo in the next couple of months to uh, work uh, more closely with countries. And the last thing that I want to announce, and this is also very exciting for us, is that we have, in collaboration with the University of Basel, the Swiss Tropical, um, the Swiss Pub Tropical and Public Health Institute, uh, set up a LMIS HMIS Center for Excellence, based in, based in Basel. Sorry, if you're not speaking, could you please mute yourself? Thanks. Um, yeah, so we are setting up the Center of Excellence in, um, in Basel, and there will be full-time implementation support staff uh, working with countries, uh, able to help countries as also development staff, actually making new apps, making new features and functionalities, uh, um, everybody working towards um, having, getting that HMIS data and that LMIS data all into one place and giving the countries the tools that they need to be able to do that. So with that, I think I will hand it now over to George. Uh, we'll stop sharing my screen. And George, you can start sharing yours. And you can take us through the work that you're doing with the ICRC. Okay, thank you very much, Scott. Um, just confirm whether you can see my screen. First slide. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very honored to, to join the DHIS2 Academy. I'm joining you from uh, the south of Yemen from a healthcare facility where we're actually piloting our system. I hope the, the line holds. So I call this system the real-time medical stock management. And basically we are piloting the use of the DHIS2 capture app for this uh, purpose. So just, um, 
to explain briefly where we are coming from, our starting point is basically a conventional stock management system that you probably all, in, all know from any kind of stock, could be a pharmacy, could be uh, a laboratory, could be uh, a, a stock of education material. And basically the way we have been operating and we still operate uh, around the world is that we have a monthly physical stock count of all items in the medical store. So you go, you count each item, it takes you two to three days. Um, every month. Um, then usually there's a manual recording of the daily consumption of all the medical supplies that have been given out to, to the wards or to the other services like the operating theater or the laboratory. And then at the end of the month, usually from the manual record, you will add up your daily consumption for calculating the monthly consumption, which will then in turn be used for forecasting and planning and calculating your replenishment orders. And in, in our case, um, where we, the healthcare facilities we support, usually those systems are, are paper-based, but they could also be using um, uh, spreadsheets, usually Excel. So the disadvantages of this system um, is that you have to carry out a complete physical stock counts um, every month, which is very time consuming. And you're basically counting every item regardless of whether you actually issue that stock or not. Um, one of the big drawbacks is that the data is available only once a month. So at the end of the month, you have your stock count, you have your consumption, you can calculate your coverage time and uh, determine how, uh, how much stock you have left and how long it will last. And this is one of the main uh, issues that we have in terms of logistics and, and demand planning is that if you have a big increase of consumption during the months for any reason, let's say you have a large number of patients or you have an outbreak, then you will basically only be able to analyze the data at the, at the end of the month. So you will only know that uh, when you carry out your physical stock count and you have the data at the end of the month. So what we are here piloting since uh, 10 days and it's working very well, is basically to look at how we can have a real time data flow. So starting at the left, um, Basically, the idea is that you have on the bottom, you have a container of amoxicillin tablets, let's say 1000 tablets, and uh, you have here the, the patient ward, and we are not uh, recording each and every stock issue. That would, of course, not be practical to record every time you use a compress or you use a cannula or, or administer a tablet or an infusion. What we do is we will scan a container when it is empty. So every time we empty let's say one container of 1000 tablets or one box of 25 canulas, then that container will be scanned with a barcode and the data will be stored in DHIS2. And in order to keep the stock replenishment system in the hospital as simple as possible, um, basically we use this concept of the one-on-one -on -one, uh, replenishment. It means that for every um, container that you emptied in a ward or in a service, you get a new container. Now you don't have to do that on a daily basis. You could, but you don't have to do that. Um, basically DHIS2 will add up all the stock issues that you have, uh, that the wards have used during the, the day or the week, or you can do it once a month or every two weeks, depending on how you manage your internal uh, distribution system in the hospital. And you could have, let's say weekly supply. So you basically tally up all the containers that you have entered uh, let's say in the pediatric ward in the first week of, of September. And then the, the pharmacy will then provide all these items that you have issued so that you replenish your stock levels according to the, to the previous stock level. So you could also uh, in principle record each and every uh, ampule of a vaccine, for example, or container that is up to how you want to use the, the system. Uh, the one one-on-one -on -one replenishment basically ensures that you don't have a complicated system with calculation and, and paper. Um, every time you scan a container in the ward, the pharmacy will basically see what has been used and can basically automat automatically uh, replenish. And the beauty of the system is that if you record all the stock issues um, by scanning the, the barcodes, and you can you enter all your stock receipts from your upstream distribution center. Let's say you receive monthly supplies. 
um, you will do that with an electronic um, data file, ideally, so you don't have to scan all the items when you receive it in the hospital. So this is part of the project to have an integrated data flow from an ERP system, where basically when electronic document behind that, an uh, EDI, electronic data interchange document, with all the items and the item codes and the quantities and even the batch numbers and expiry dates. And basically when you receive those consignments in the pharmacy, you will basically load it into DHIS2 and those quantities will be added to your stock. So if you enter all your stocks electronically and you issue all your stocks um, that you're distributing to the wards and services also electronically, then basically the system can automatically calculate the stock on hand uh, without the need for, for any stock count. Of course, you have to have checks and balances because if you just re run the system and re assume that everyone is 100% reliable, eventually there will be mistakes and you will have to make corrections. But there are checks and balances um, in the system that allow you uh, during, the, during the day, for example, when you enter an entire container to check whether that um, container that you are now emptying in the pharmacy matches your current stock position. And then this data that you are collecting at the end user level, so at a hospital pharmacy, can then be fed in real time to your logistics management information system, whatever you are using. So Scott already mentioned um, the possible integration with uh, Medexis, which has been in principle um, tested uh, that uh, integration with the REST API is working. And you can feed that demand data directly from the healthcare facility all the way up um, even to include your suppliers if they, if they want the data uh, so that they, they can plan. And then of course you have the DHIS2 as an established health management information system. And as Scott pointed out, you can then link the HMIS and LMIS data in, in, in real time um, for, for various analytics <coughs> purposes. And since you know at all levels of the supply chain, if you are recording the stock issues and tallying up the totals per week or per month, then it's very simple to replenish all the stocks basically at all the district, provincial, national level. Ideally, basically everyone is just receiving from upstream what they have issued during the, during the last months. So the, uh, the, my last slide you can see at the bottom of the screen is basically the system as we are actually using it on a daily day-to-day -day basis. So you can see we have these containers where we uh, have, for example, COVID on and we have the malaria test. And each of those containers are labeled actually with a barcode and a description. And when we want to issue, let's say one box of malaria tests, 25 tests in a box, we will simply scan the barcode and then record the, the quantity, so one kit. And then you can even record exactly to what service you have distributed those items. You can record uh, basically the day, the time that it has been given to the female or male ward or operating theater uh, with a quantity. And that is then locked and available in the analytics table in DHIS2. So the advantages of the system is that it's, it's paperless. As I said, you do have to have checks and balances. Uh, you have an electronic record of all stock transactions. So that's actually quite impressive. You can actually scan a stock issue and you can go on your database and you can see um, all your stock issues with the date, time and so on. You have an automatic record of your daily, weekly, monthly consumption. So you don't have to record that consumption on paper. One thing that is really nice is that you have a real time stock on hand information that you can share with uh, the hospital staff. So every time somebody, let's say if I issue this uh, kit of 25 malaria tests, then basically in real time, the, the server is calculate, recalculating my stock position. Anybody who wants to know what is the stock position of our 180 items today in the pharmacy at any time, they can basically connect and they can view that data. So they don't need to ask, you don't need to share Excel files or post it or if somebody even in the ward wanted to know where a certain item is available, they could just pull out their mobile phone and check what is available in the pharmacy. Um, as I mentioned, you have real-time visibility in the upstream LMIS. So that's very uh, useful for planners at upstream level, let's say national or regional logistics centers uh, to determine if there's a, 
large increase for any item, let's say you had an outbreak, and instead of waiting until the end of the month and then noticing that you have a lot of clinics asking for a, a large amount of a certain antibiotic or a certain diagnostic test, you could basically anticipate these orders by setting up automatic alerts um, in the system that will um, notify you when there is an exceptional large increase of demand of certain items. And then, of course, um, you, it allows um, complex analytics. Scott already showed some dashboards, particularly on the stock, uh, stock availability and the potential shortage. And you can also link your real-time stock data with the HMIS data, as Scott also already mentioned, um, number of patients, the epidemiology. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thanks so much, George. That's a really incredible, cutting edge case of how to use DHIS2 for supply chain. So now we're going to um, change it up a little bit and switch over to talking about our uh, a few case studies on lab management information systems. And our first presenter is Zuina, and I'll invite you to go ahead and start sharing your screen and take it away. Thank you, thank you. Okay. that at first, there you go. Great, looks okay. good. Hi everyone, uh, good day to everyone. My name is Wena from Tanzania, working with the Ministry of Health um, in the National Program uh, for Tuberculosis and Leprosy. I'm going to share with you just our, our experience, how the tracker module really um, improved the effectiveness of our sample referral, um, our laboratory sample referral system. So Tanzania is an East, East African country um, about 900,000 square kilometers with a population around 56 million people by um, last year and healthcare wise we have around 8,400 facilities which most of them are dispensaries at the lower level. Administrative wise this is how the healthcare um, is organized from the lower level the community and then reporting to the facility and then to the district region and uh, at the national level where the ministry uh, the ministry sits. Well, uh, what was the problem? As, uh, as you know, Tanzania is among the high uh, TB burden country. We still have the tuberculosis um, problem. And this is a deadly disease, causes a lot of deaths, but it is treatable. However, the treatment is uh, with the antibiotics, which are quietly, um, I can say, strong, uh, but also costful, and they take a long time. So because of that, um, we really need to do the sensitivity um, testing so that we make sure that these uh, patients are really um, cured. And we do the, before the sensitivity, we do the growing of the bacteria, that is the culture, and then the, the sensitivity part. So um, in Tanzania, we have two main groups of, of patients uh, for the tuberculosis, uh, which we are supposed to, to perform the culture and the DST. We have those patients who are being sick for the second or third time with TB, and, but also we have those patients who are directly being diagnosed with drug resistance. So what happened is that in our country, as I've said, it's a little bit uh, fairly large. However, um, we, we have only six um, laboratories, uh, which we call the zonal, the zonal labs, which are able to, to conduct the culture. You can see these are the ones. But we have only one here, around here, which uh, actually can perform the drug and sensitivity test, the phenotypic one, which is the one which is more reliable. So what happens is that um, all these patients across the country, their samples will be sent to the zonal labs, and then from the zonal labs may be up to the, to the, um, the central laboratory, um, laboratory one, which is uh, in the Dar es Salaam region. So um, we used our post office for this transportation. And this is usually um, used to happen in the past four to three years. When we sit um, to discuss our cases, especially the drug resistance cases, the, the expert panel sits to discuss. Usually we use our, our paper files and we start to discuss um, how are the patient uh, doing and all that. And it happened that when we, we want to, to know the results at a certain um, time of period when they checked, we found that there's no result. And the, when the laboratory um, representative will be asked, we we'll have several reasons, like um, actually the sample is not, um, it was rejected. The sample is not enough. 
or okay, the results are here, but the results actually did not reach the point where the patient is. So really this caused a lot of frustrations uh, among the healthcare workers and the coordinators, and the situation was not good. Uh, about only 13% of our re uh, retreatment patients have the results for the drug sensitivity test, and about half of the drug-resistant TB patients did not have their complete sets of, uh, of the results. So that's why we decided to use the tracker module. At that time, we were using the DHIS2 as aggregate, and then we, we started using the tracker module for the case base. So we introduced the culture and DST lab register so that now it can be used um, to request the, the samples. So when the healthcare workers send a, uh, a, a sample through the post office, they request uh, that request in the system, and immediately the laboratory personnel will receive that message that there is a sample which is on the way. And when they receive the sample, then they will um, respond if it is accepted or not. So at least there is a communication about that. If another sample is needed, then that can be done. But also when the results are out, um, results are out, then the laboratory uh, personnel, they just key in the results, and uh, those healthcare workers, um, they will receive the results, as you can see here, is, is an alert message that the results are actually out for that patient, and they can instantly um, see the results. Um, so this really improved uh, the condition because uh, previously we used to depend on the emails until you scan the results and then send to emails and sometimes it was not working or sometimes just calling. So um, after that, for the 2018, we, we could see that really this improved our, our, our performance. You can see in 2018 now, we have almost 80% of the retreatment cases having their, their DST results. But also another thing is that now the drug resistant um, TB patient, we have all their results. And really this made it possible during the COVID-19 um, outbreak when we, ha um, we, we, we had to do the virtual expert reviews. So this really uh, made it uh, possible because of this, of this system. So um, I can say that uh, the tracker module really improved our sample referral um, system, the, the culture and drug sensitivity system, and it has improved visibility and also communicate, communication linkage with the alert uh, messages and all that. But we still have challenges with the ICT at the rural areas, as we are all familiar with this. But also the fact that our register, you can see there, our, 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 our surveillance system, it has three registers the TB register, the DRTB register, and uh, now the CATCH and DST register. So it means registering a patient three or two times. So um, we are working on this to match all the registers to make the system more user friendly so that the patient can be just um, registered just once. But we are also um, going to improve the system um, improve the, the tracking by using the barcode, but also those areas which do not have internet connectivity um, to start using the Android app. So really that was just a snapshot of how the tracker module really uh, helped us and improve the effectiveness and efficiency of our sample transportation. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Suina. That's a really incredible, uh, case study. Um, I'd like to ex maybe explore more with you on how you are looking across those three programs for that one patient. I think that if you tune in tomorrow for the um, roadmap session, we're going to start, to, hopefully we'll present some like actual solutions to, to that particular problem that I know a lot of folks out there are having with, with Tracker. Multiple programs for just one patient and you want to see all that data in one place. Okay. So, much, yeah. Absolutely. So let's pass it on over to Billy in Malawi. And you can start sharing your screen, Billy, and take it away. So um, greetings, everyone. I hope I'm audible and you can see my screen. Yeah, so looks great. Is, yeah. So my name is uh, Billy Rajab. I work as a uh, software products manager for the Ministry of Health under the Quality Management Directorate in Digital Health. Uh, this is the Kunika project. So the theme of the presentation is how Malawi 
has integrated the uh, lab management system with uh, national surveillance tool uh, that was built with uh, the DHS2 tr uh, tracker programs to reduce the human capacity strain and also to streamline the COVID-19 response. All right, so uh, the CUNIC uh, uh, Data for Action project uh, is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So the goal is to uh, increase data demand, supply, and promote data governance. So we focus, our focus is on six districts, um, but due to COVID-19, we had to scale up to all the uh, 29 districts in Malawi. Um, so, uh, so the, um, the Malawi government uh, adopted the uh, integrated uh, disease surveillance and response as the main disease surveillance approach. Um, just recently, uh, we adopted the idea of the one health surveillance. Now, um, the one health surveillance is an integrated multi-sector and uh, collaborative approach to disease surveillance. So it promotes uh, the compartmentalization of human animal, ecosystem health, for more efficient and sustainable governance of complex health issues. So we use the DHIS2 instance as the one health surveillance platform. All right, uh, so we, um, we have leveraged uh, the, uh, the DHIS2 one health surveillance platform uh, for COVID-19 digital response uh, by customizing the the WHO COVID-19 surveillance digital data package. Uh, so what, you see, what you're looking at on the screen here is, uh, is the, uh, the DHIS2, uh, the, the whole workflow, how we are able to uh, integrate um, different systems. Uh, I mean, sorry, the, um, the LMI, uh, the uh, uh, LIMS system uh, with the case-based surveillance system uh, as a surveillance tool, um, uh, to track um, uh, uh, lab orders, uh, as well as to uh, send lab requests and get a response from the, the different labs. All right, so if you can see the pointer here, uh, this is the one hit surveillance. We have a number, of, a number of programs that were created within the one hit surveillance platform as a surveillance tool. We have the port of entry screening, we have the case-based surveillance, we have the contact registration and follow-up, and the confirmed case clinical management um, Program. So within the case-based surveillance um, program, we have a couple of stages. Uh, so we start with uh, the clinical examination, then um, a lab order is generated. Uh, so uh, uh, this is a, a stage which is an event-based, so you can create as many lab, lab orders as you like. So this uh, request, it, it's uh, relayed through the interoperability layer, and this is the, uh, we leverage the uh, open HIM, um, for health information, health information exchange. And this information is relayed to the national LIMS, uh, the Laboratory Information Management System. And this system here, it's also integrated with another system that is also managed by another partner, which is the, um, the EIDVL, which uh, does the, uh, the PCR uh, tests for COVID-19. So when the, um, when the tests are done here, uh, the information is uh, is sent back uh, through the same uh, the same channel. It goes back to the national limbs. Then that information also is related to the interoperability layer. Then it's uh, it's so sort of captured into the lab result um, as, as a response to the request that was generated. Uh, so uh, we have managed to deploy the surveillance tool to about 23 districts, and uh, we have more than uh, 700 users. Um, in, on daily basis, we have about 44 um, uh, lab requests that are generated from different uh, areas where uh, um, reduce the human capacity needed. Uh, for instance, for you to be able to capture uh, the record systems, uh, so we have the HS2 tracker as well as the, uh, the, uh, the National uh, uh, Laboratory Information Management System. Uh, that, would, uh, that would take time um, and we will need people to do that. 
also transporting the, the forms. Um, when the samples are collected, uh, the, we have people who are responsible to do that. We call them the uh, district rapid response teams. Uh, so these people, they have to transport the forms to the, to the labs. Then um, when the tests are done, uh, we have to find ways or a mechanism how uh, the information will be relayed back to the districts. Now that uh, proved to be a bit of challenging. So what was needed here is uh, the retained, uh, sort of like the, um, uh, the retaining sort of uh, um, approach in how people are able to send the lab results to the different facilities or different districts. We had to automate the process. Now this information flows back through that same channel to the, um, to the, uh, to, to the respected presses or uh, districts. So this also has reduced uh, the number, uh, I mean, the huge logistical investment. So we need people to be moving up and down within the district and the, and the different labs that are there for, for us to be able to um, coordinate the work. And also uh, it has increased the data quality and the uh, integrity. So uh, there's, no, um, there's no one who is, uh, the data is captured once, so the information is relayed uh, to the other systems. So there's no need for someone to recapture the data. Um, of course, we have a, a couple of challenges uh, with the implementation. Uh, connectivity is a challenge, so sometimes um, the lab, the lab, uh, the samples reach the labs, uh, but the information hasn't really reflected in the uh, the other systems, the national uh, uh, laboratory information management system. So uh, the uh, the lab technicians would uh, won't be able to see the, the records at some point in time. So that's one of the challenges we have. So like users are not adhering some to the workflows that we have uh, implemented. So some, they take time to capture the information into the case-based surveillance system and also to uh, actually generate uh, the lab orders. So the samples reach the labs before that information reaches the, uh, the actual labs through the integration. Um, and some of the, the equipment that we have deployed, people are not using them for work-related issues. Uh, they're using them for personal. That's uh, another huge challenge uh, with the setup. Uh, so that marks the end of my presentation. So thanks so much for your attention. Thank you. Over to you, Scott. Great. Thank you so much, Billy. Uh, another really incredible use case. Um, and it's, it's incredible to see what you all have built in terms of the interoperability layer using open HIM. It's, it's really a, a, a pretty unique success story on, on building off that platform and connecting these various systems to DHIS2. Um, we do actually have a few minutes for some questions from the community. Um, we'll start with the folks who actually posted in the community of practice form. We, again, we, if you have questions, please post those to the link uh, in the community practice um, uh, link. The first question, there's actually two questions here, I think, for George and Zuina. You might be able to uh, weigh in on this one as well. Um, using the barcode scanner, um, Arthur Haywood, um, one of the original founders of DHIS2, right, well, uh, DHIS1, uh, asks, um, do you need electricity or how often do you need electricity if you're using the barcode scanner? Does it work offline? Um, do you need to have your phone plugged in all the time? What are the resources that you need to be able to do the barcode scanning? George? Okay, so for the barcode scanning, we use a simple mobile, mobile phone. I, pre I prefer to use a tablet PC because the screen is larger, but it works with a mobile phone. Uh, I don't think we have particular issues with, uh, with charging. Of course, it's a kind of trap when you use barcoding, you always have to make sure that your mobile phone or devices is charged at all times. Uh, one interesting aspect is just, um, you need to be sure to, to have enough light in your store and um, also to make sure that those barcodes are printed nicely and evenly because apparently when you have wrinkles, it doesn't work well. But um, on, the, um, um, on, on the charging issue, I, we, we don't really have an issue. Uh, we also use power banks. So that's always a good um, um, device to have with you in case uh, you have, would have a prolonged power failure so that you always have another let's say half day of, of power to, to run your barcode scanner. Thank you. All right, thanks. Another question, and I think this goes for everyone here. Uh, I think everyone could answer it is, uh, uh, Kim asks, 
Is there any customization? Have you done any like custom scripts or custom applications or anything um, on these three various projects to get them to work? Have you developed your own applications or custom scripts in DHIS too? And uh, maybe uh, Billy, we can, or George, can we start with you and just quickly say if you've done any customization or not? No, I have, I have not done any customization. So all stock DHIS2, nothing. Yeah. Okay. And all, all uh, standard. Zuina, have you guys done any customization? We had our, 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 our local expertise are, are online. Kalisti, was that a customized one? Uh, yes, uh, of course. Uh, the one that is currently on use was a bit customized, but of course we are almost deploying another one which is not customized at all. Right, okay. So a little bit of customization to get yourself started, but now it's, uh, you're moving back to more generic features. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay, that's really, that's really interesting. Um, and Billy, did you guys do any customization on the DHS2 side? Um, Hi, Scott. Uh, not really. Uh, that's uh, the generic setup. So there, were, there was no any customization. That's that's really incredible, actually, that DHIS2 is, is able to be so generically across these really three very different but and, and very advanced use cases. Um, we have just a few more minutes, three minutes. Any other questions out there from the community? Can I just chip in something quickly? Yeah, sure, go ahead, George. Yeah, so just because I was reading the original question, so uh, related to electricity, so uh, I mean, since DHIS2 has this great offline functionality, you're not uh, depending on uh, electricity or network connection to actually do the scanning. So as long as your mobile phone is charged, you can, you can scan the codes, um, let's say for an hour, if there's a power failure, even for, for half a day, and then when your net when the power supply comes back or if your network was not available then you can synchronize your data so you're you're not dependent for your daily routine work you're not dependent on on either electricity or having a permanent internet connection thank you okay so maybe time for one more question george just comes in from winnie monze um He's asking, uh, how do you handle products that don't have barcodes from suppliers or manufacturers? George, how do you, you're muted. Well, maybe George will have to answer that one in the community of practice. And I think that that then winds us up for our session. I, again, I really want to sincerely thank George, um, uh, Zuina and Billy for their uh, willingness to present and for telling us about their really incredible uh, case studies. I also appreciate every, all of you who've listened in. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to post those questions still in the community of practice. We'll make sure that you get an answer to your questions. Um, and of course, if you're really interested in knowing more about the supply chain use case, you can always just email me. I'm scott at dhis2.org. And I think with that, I will hand it back over two minutes early to Grant. Thanks, Scott.